Good afternoon. 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 Good
Eddie Webster and all the others. So this is part of what we call keeping Sasa alive. And uh, as we discuss this issue, we're starting to think we're trying also to keep sociology and social science alive. Because with the disruption of COVID-19, the first thing which happened to us as Sasa, we had to cancel uh, our annual Congress. And it looks like our next Congress next year will be held online. But you also feel that there are many things happening in the world which I challenge to sociology and to social science. And we feel that we have to assert the relevance of our discipline, especially against technicist and economistic solutions to the problems posed by the pandemic. And then lastly, I just want to say that uh, part of <clears throat> this seminar series is also to reach out uh, to the various departments of sociology and other social scientific departments in South Africa and beyond, uh, because we feel that SASA is the home and should promote and support and offer solidarity uh, to all uh, practicing sociologists, uh, postgraduate students, and uh, those who are with us. So let me end off by saying that uh, one famous uh, uh, president uh, of a sociological association was Michael Burroway. Uh, who was uh, president of the International Sociological Association of which we are an affiliate. So when he took over uh, as president uh, of the International Association, he promoted this idea of a public sociology. I'm not going to do that as the president, but I do think that we must look back into uh, the history of sociology in South Africa in the struggle against apartheid when everyone was calling for a relevant uh, intellectual practice uh, in the universities. So I'm hoping that through this small step today, we can start a debate and a discussion which we can take forward and to keep our disciplines, our academic work, our intellectual ideas relevant to making a better society. Thank you very much. Welcome again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President, for those uh, opening remarks. Um, I'm not going to waste any time, colleagues. I will try by all means to be as invincible as possible uh, in the discussion uh, to allow the, and the conversations and the conversation to flow. Um, let me now go straight to our first speaker, uh, Professor Ashwin Tisai. Um, Professor Ashwin Tsai is a professor of sociology at the Department of Sociology at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, he is an unusually prolific and wide ranging writer whose work has been published in academic and popular books and journals around the world. His latest book titled Wentworth, The Beautiful Game and the Making of Place has recently been published. It is available out there. And then he also has another book co-authored with Ashul Adrian titled Line Breakers and History Makers, The Rabbi Playing Sons of Makana and Stirman, of which this book will be published later this year. So we've asked Professor Ashwin Desai to come uh, to our association this afternoon uh, to help us grapple with this uh, uh, question that we've put on the table on sociology, pandemics, and disasters the visiting theories, contradictions, and uh, prospects. I won't go any further, Prof, uh, but rather to hand over the floor to you uh, to please address the sociology in the social science community of South Africa. Over to you, Prof. Uh, thanks so much, Pedro, uh, and, and thank you for being uh, so wonderful in organizing this. Um, I must say also it's a, it's a real uh, honor to share platform uh, with Prof. Nkise and, and uh, because, you know, uh, she's both a historian and a sociologist. And, and through the years in, in both in South African academia and, and elsewhere, there's always been these contests between sociologists and historians. And, and I think E.H. Carl 
uh, famously argued that the more sociological history becomes and the more historical sociology becomes, the better for both. And it appears that uh, Prof. Kize, by having an MA in history and a PhD in sociology, uh, took E.H. Carr to heart. And I think we all look forward to hearing from her. Uh, for those of us um, schooled in the discipline in the early 1980s, uh, C. Wright Mills, The Sociological Imagination, um, written in 1959, was the book that uh, uh, came to epitomize uh, what sociology was trying to do at the time and the debates they were engaging in. And, uh, you know, his central issue was about how you turn private troubles into public issues. And in preparation for the seminar, um, you know, I went back to read it, um, written in 1959, the, the date of my birth. And he writes, you know, nowadays people often feel their private lives are a series of traps. They sense that within their everyday worlds, they cannot overcome their troubles. And in this feeling, they are quite correct. What ordinary people are directly aware of and what they try to do are bounded by the private orbits in which they live. And the more aware they become, however vaguely of ambitions and of threats, which transcend their immediate locales, the more trapped they seem to feel. So the coming of COVID has only served to reinforce these trends that C. Wright Mills talks about. Restrictions on movement, social gatherings and the like have forced people into no narrower and narrower confines. The virus is seemingly a force that we cannot fathom, disappearing and reappearing, sneaking through borders, baiting governments to enact policies like social distancing that are impossible to Im implement and turning people who police our behavior and those of others. Love thy neighbor has now mutated into judge your neighbor. Spear them, if you will, turning us all into a nation of impimpies. And so we, we, we talk about the seminar at a time when dystopian images sit alongside utopian possibilities. And so my, what I want to raise then in this talk is what kind of impacts that were already happening but I mean, accelerated by COVID, both at the university and on sociology as a discipline. Well, the one thing is that the first thing to, you know, that we need to take cognizance of is this accelerated drive towards online learning. Now, the philosopher Gumbin argues that the turn to online goes beyond the diminution of life experience and ways of seeing given the dominance of the computer screen. He writes, much more decisive is what is taking place is something that significantly is not spoken of at all, namely the end of being a student as a form of life. Instead, students will listen to lectures closed up in their rooms and sometimes separated by hundreds of kilometers from those who were formerly their classmates. While a government might be accused of romanticizing universities, he goes on to concede that universities have grown complacent and their place as foundations of knowledge production and dissemination were eroding already. I quote, about every social phenomenon that dies, it can be said in a certain sense, it deserved its end. It is certain that our universities reach such a degree of corruption and specialist ignorance that it isn't possible to mourn them and the form of life students consequently has been equally impoverished. In my own experience, chunks of the academy have long quarantined themselves from experiences outside the lager, living in a world of texts and textbooks. As a point made by Jeff, uh, by Jeff Dyer, and this is what he writes, this is the hallmark of academic criticism. It kills everything it touches. Walk around a university campus and there's an almost palpable sense of death about the place because hundreds of academics are busy killing everything they touch. I recently met an academic who said he taught German literature. I was aghast to think this man who has been at universities all his life was teaching Rilke. You don't teach Rilke, I want you to say. You turn him into dust, and then you go off to conferences where dozens of other academic morticians gather with the express intention of killing Rilke and turning him into dust. How can you know anything about literature if all you've done is read books? This deconstructive method is all the rage at universities and was exposed in 2018 when it was revealed that three researchers in the United States 
had stage managed a hoax by publishing fake research in highly respected journals. Their intention was to expose ideological bias and lack of careful reviewing oversight. Of the 20 articles submitted, seven were accepted after review protests process. And you've got to listen to the titles of these articles to know what's in them. One of the articles was human reaction to rape culture and queer oppression, human reaction to rape culture and queer pom pom performativity at urban dog park in Portland, Oregon. It's sought to inquire in this article, do dogs suffer oppression based on perceived gender? Another of the articles past peer review made the case that a man masturbating while thinking of a woman without a consent is committing sexual assault. Entitled, Rubbing One Out, Defining Metasexual Violence of Objectification Through Non-Consensual Masturbation. Similarly, the corridor of the academic are also notorious for power games and the need for recognition. As Johann Menken, German professor of history, writing in 1937, but easily pertinent to our present, pointed out, Quackery is found not only among physicians, but almost everywhere among the learned. Believing that they become more godlike in proportion to the amount of applause they receive, they seek it no less eagerly than they suck in the air that they breathe. Just as the charlatans on the streets are wont to display their degrees and diplomas and to arrogate themselves high sounding and extraordinary titles, so among presumably better men are found not a few who court rank and position by means of new and impressive titles. The nature and form of the performance evaluation system for academics often serves to reinforce these tendencies. The emphasis on output marked by annual performance indicators. The chance to work on a book for over four or five years that is path breaking comes up against a system designed to reward quick fire journal articles. Journals themselves are policed by those who set up journals in the first place, privileging old networks or those who are prepared to play by their rules. Doet seems to be populated by Kafkaesque figures who make the filling of forms more difficult than the writing of articles. The emphasis is to concentrate on a narrow area of discipline, defending your turf like any worthy drug lord and resulting in what Mills Wright called the la lazy safety of specialization. There is danger in all this that we'll flatten our students and global experiences. What does this approach mean for the decolonizing of knowledge? We have much talk of rereading the archive, liberating the archive, but decolonizing is fundamentally about also creating new archives. Yet the new original research is in short supply. Where does sociology then stand in this, ter in this changing terrain? Reading through a cross section of international journals, one feels somewhat lost in this wave that is sweeping the discipline. There we find articles entitled Machine Learning for Sociology. Another article, The Rival of Social Science Genomics. Another, Why Sociology Matters to Race and Biological Science that takes us a long way from the original sociology that is still taught in all our departments that is entitled Nurture versus Nature. Social, social genomics name is given to the combination of genetics and sociology, challenging the old Durkheim boundary between the social and the non-social. Sam have worn like bliss in his book entitled Social by Nature, the promise and peril of social genomics, that this could introduce, introduce eugenics through the back door and succumb to a genetic determinism. But one cannot simply ignore the rise of genetic genealogy and the mountains of data amassed. It takes us beyond the boundary of nature and nurture and the interaction between the two. There's an old saying that when Althusser was all the rage, that history is too important to be left to the historians. Well, one could say that today, biology is too important to be left to the biologists. There are questions which COVID raises that strike at the heart of research and knowledge. What does traditional fieldwork mean in the age of the pandemic? Us methodologies like participant observation and life histories reduced to Margaret Mead's great native of the times past? As Mayor Schoenberger and Kirkia point out, in the age of small data, we were driven by hypothesis about how the world worked, which we attempted to validate by collecting and analyzing data. 
in the future, our understanding will be driven more by the abundance of data rather than by the hypothesis. But there are dangers. As Sadar points out, an uncritical reliance on big data is fraught with danger. And this is what he writes. Big data does not differentiate between facts and alternative facts, truth or lies, knowledge or bullshit, news or fake news, politics or conspiracy theories, legitimate concerns of dissidents or the paranoia of anonymous online mobs, genuinely, genuine comedy or racism and bigotry masquerading as earthy humor, irony and sarcasm. All is sho shoveled up. As such, big data is a report repository for playing ignorance, blatant lies, obvious bullshit, and the dark paraphernalia we find on social media, online platforms, and other digital apparatuses. It is essentially a post-normal no post phenomenon. As such, big data incorporates the three C's of post-normal times. It is complex, interconnected, networked. It is contradictory. It accumulates widely diverging truths, falsehoods, behaviors, orientations, ideologies, and worldviews. This danger is accompanied by the question of who owns big data. As Harari points out, big data algorithms might create digital dictatorships in which all power is concentrated in the hands of a tiny elite, while most people suffer not from exploitation, but from something far worse, irrelevance. An increasing number of social scientists increasingly employ speed and power algorithms for their own big data problems in the hope to develop a science of society that will study society at scale. Governments and corporations increasingly turn to social algorithms as more efficient techniques to make automated predictions about health, crime, and general life chances. There is a danger then that race can be reconstituted in digital form. Algorithms can help confer and amplify racist ideologies like sup white supremacy on the internet. Racialized meaning, structures, and conduct can be built into these complex calculations, seamlessly automating inequality. How then do we bring a critical challenge and perspective to these, these developments? In 2020, we need to develop methodologies that go beyond the separation of the sciences into natural and social and to encourage ways of thinking that address interactions. In this trend, there's a call for going beyond seeing sociology and biology as opposing disciplines. COVID-19 has brought home how the notion of some pure science dealing from the social is fraught with dangers. While university professors are still engaged in trench warfare, policing the border of their disciplines and grudgingly conceding some form of interdisciplinarity, the world is changing. In Googie's plea of not remaining cocooned in our libraries and scholarly disciplines, muttering to ourselves, I'm only a surgeon, I'm a scientist, I'm an economist, or I'm simply a critic, a teacher, a lecturer, but rather to turn the struggles into spheres of common knowledge and above all justice into fashion is as relevant as ever, but will not simply be advanced by the machine learning of sociology. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, without uh, wasting any time, I will uh, introduce the, the second speaker, uh, <clears throat> the discussant, rather, uh, Professor Nomala Ngamkize. Uh, professor Nomala Ngamkize is a professor of history uh, and also currently the HOD, Head of Department uh, of Political Science and History, at Nelson Mandela University. Uh, she is a strong advocate for early mother tongue reading and has collaborated with developing books and materials in the African languages for children. Professor Mkiza's current research interests is in the Eastern Cape historiography, amongst other things. Professor Mkiza has an MA in history from Rhodes University and also a doctorate from the University of Cape Town in Sociology. Professor Nomalangam Kieser, the floor is yours. Thanks, Pedro. And uh, hi, everybody. And uh, uh, hi, Ashwin. It's, it's, it's wonderful to share uh, space again. Um, wonderful. Thank you. And I also just want to say that I'm a terrible sociologist. Um, <laughs> I'm a better historian than I am a sociologist, but I think that, you know, as a 
as somebody in Africa, as a black person, that you can't be you can't be bound by discipline. You can't you can't deal with the black condition in a box. So, with that in mind, I'm so grateful, Ashwin, that you have done exactly what I was hoping you would do here. And I uh, was a bit I was a bit reluctant to talk because I don't have time for humanities debates anymore. But um, you know, uh, I'm so glad, Ashwin, that you 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 speak your 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 intellectual truth as you normally would, and you you that combative sense of ethics around what our role is. And um, I I I have nothing good to say about the humanities, and I'm stuck in a humanities discipline. Um, uh, I, I, I'm reminded of a 2015 uh, article I wrote when I, I, I had a column on the business day when uh, the Ebola outbreak broke out. And uh, I just looked around and I just said, you know what, the people, those of us in the humanities need to just, um, just sometimes relax a bit with our sense of moral superiority and sense of intellectual, uh, 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 whatever it is we think that we have over the social, the, the, the natural sciences. Because when Ebola was breaking out, it was doctors who were dying, it wasn't sociologists. And then when you have the debate and people are like, oh no, but they need an anthropologist to go and tell them about the culture of the people. I was like, that's so colonial. Why do they need an anthropologist to tell them about what's going on in their countries or in their communities? Okay, what doctor, doctor with the heart. and. Uh, Myself being the uh, a child of two medical doctors who were trained in the uh, tradition of black consciousness and the liberation movements, um, certainly uh, sociology was something you learned in struggle. You did not need to learn it in the middle of uh, a, a lecture theater and be told about your condition. It was something you, it was an outcome of your own ethical politics. So uh, I, I remember this article that I wrote and I, I basically said the humanities uh, are actually, even though we, we need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have a critical tradition, uh, uh, the tradition that we, we, we keep boasting about in the universities, you know, is, is, it's, it's, a, it's a form of arrogance when you yourself are not about to go out there and put on PPE and actually uh, put your life on the line while people are dying in a hospital. Um, and uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the notion that uh, because we're in the humanities, we have a much deeper understanding of social inequality. I mean, really, is there anybody who has a deeper sense of social inequality than the person that must operate on people who have gunshot wounds, <laughs> you know, and uh, are dealing with the, 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 the scourge of violence in South Africa and in the world at large? So this idea that the humanities have, uh, you know, we exist to teach others about, you know, inequality, power, social structure is absolute bullshit. It's charlatanry. And uh, I think we need to uh, ask ourselves how we got to a point in some sense where we pontificate to society whilst we offer nothing of tangible relevance. Um, of course, we, 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 we always have this debate and uh, Ashwin, you've raised this in some sense of what is the relevance of the humanities in this tech and, and Trevor, uh, spoke about the problem of the, techn the technicism that emerges that, de that delegitimizes the value of the humanities in the universities. Um, so on the one hand, we've got this onslaught uh, coming from the, the, the corporatized, uh, commercialized world of neoliberal scientific knowledge production that, that turns the humanities actually into its own sort of machinery and its own image. But on the other hand, you've got the university itself which uh, has uh, become so corporatized and so commercialized in its approach that uh, within the university, you see that academics themselves uh, do this. This is why we've had all this nonsense all around us. Where within two weeks of COVID breaking out, there's already research calls about, you know, uh, let's all start researching uh, the meaning of COVID research grants are being thrown about it, uh, submitted proposal. There's money for COVID research, no, absolute nonsense. When people are starving, you should be in your community packing food finding ways of feeding people by here you are busy submitting the funding proposal because you want to be seen to have responded to COVID in your KPIs. So we see that the, the, the universities as a, as a space, as an, as a, the, the, what, 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 uh, I shouldn't put so beautifully this, this thing that, you know, actually the universities are the ones in quarantine. In fact, it's impossible to mourn the death of the university, which is a process that's been happening over the past 40 years with neoliberalization. Um, and in fact, it's true that what uh, academics touch, they kill. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and I would argue that the humanities and social sciences are not at all uh, exempt from this. We see this with the rise of the sacred cow 
syndrome because we all have to save our careers. Um, uh, we see how, for example, even though the humanities positions themselves externally to their university as being the champions of, of uh, you know, we are the ones who are championing society, we are the ones that are championing, but in fact, we are terrified of each other within the university space. We destroy uh, uh, the, the very concept of, of academic debate and intellectual integrity. We see the emergence of people like uh, Judith Butler as sacred cows that can no longer be uh, 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 debated, you know, like Judith Butler who sits in her lovely privileged uh, uh, um, tenured job in the United States as a, as a, as a rich uh, sort of white protected professor that can no longer be debated whilst, you know, uh, the, 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 the masses of, of, of uh, poor people around the world are grappling with a world that is changing so fast that the universities are not even keeping up with, but you know, we've got to take these sacred uh, texts because we don't touch our, our sacred scholars. And so we see all the charlatanry, you know, before you even had the word charlatan there, Ashwin, I, 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 it was one of the words I made sure that I must just say, I'm so, we, we are charlatans and we are selling quackery as social theory. Um, selling quackery uh, in the name of decolonization, this new uh, weird uh, decoloniality trend, which I've already uh, made it clear to people that I don't take seriously um, for its uh, um, uh, sort of elitist, uh, uh, overly textually based concept of what decolonizing in Africa actually means. The new wave of very toxic uh, intersectional politics that's really mob driven with absolutely no intellectual um, heart or in, in, in intelligence about the contextual factors in, in, in the range of our lives across the world. Global South courses where, you know, you, you teaching English literature, but you've exercised even the people who invented the English language itself. And in a way, by, 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 by doing this kind of strange um, purism and, 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 and fundamentalism within the humanities, uh, actually dehistoricizing knowledge and dehistoricizing the emergence of, of the human um, intellectual traditions around the world, and in some sense, uh, actually de uh, de de denuding them of any sense of complexity uh, in, in, their, in, their re in their emergence. Well, then it's no surprise that by the time we have COVID, you know, you've got, you know, on Facebook, people with PhDs sending around conspiracy theories about um, vaccines and the rest of it, and, and trying to, to find these, these links between, you know, uh, these, these conspiratorial links between big pharma and Africa. I mean, that was promulgated across my social media by people with a lot of education. And so in that sense, um, the humanities uh, cannot take any sense of moral authority on any of the things that uh, they claim that uh, they, they have moral authority over. And um, given that we've come to a point where we no longer are able to speak truth, we speak career, and where we lack any sense of generous, righteous militants, um, and we've replaced that with the sense of um, uh, very uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of surveillancing, uh, surveillancing the knowledge project uh, in the service actually of one's academic career, but actually on the outside you pretend that is because you're so enmeshed in, in people's struggles when you're actually not. So with that in mind, I mean, uh, the question is, is there anything to salvage here? Is there anything to salvage of our disciplines as we sit here on Zoom, thanks to some tech uh, genius that put us together because we don't have the skills? Um, is there something for us to talk about here? And I think that, um, the, the humanities can only do what it has always been there to do, and that is to really speak to the soul of the human condition in the complexity of what it means to be human, but to do so without any fear of, um, of, 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 of the concept of, of being surveillance or, 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 or the fear of one's uh, career being uh, potentially um, um, sort of derailed by the fact that you want to look at all the multiple complexities of human life. I mean, an example of this is basically these articles that proliferated about how COVID was so terrible for women. And my question was, but genuinely speaking, genuinely speaking, where did this research get done? And how many um, um, different kinds of poor communities in the world were studied before all these? Uh, is that the one lens that we can use so in an attempt to assert, everyone wants to assert this feminist um, intersectional paradigm that's actually done nothing in the current instance, but narrow our view of the wide nature of how the collapse of late capitalism is actually affecting the human condition. Automation, big data, 
the final, the, the result of this, in fact, is that we have absolutely de-skilled the students in the humanities who no longer see the necessity of uptaking the technical rigor of the scientific tradition and the difficulties of actually mastering scientific uh, argument and debate and looking at scientific data so that you can actually um, uh, uh, be able to properly uh, deconstruct it because all you have to say is gender. Most now all you just have to say is gender, and nobody can question whether that's the correct lens and the correct formulation of a particular human question. Um, so uh, you have these these um, these these this, this narrowing of 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 view, and and yet it legitimizes itself because it it, it mimics the the languages of 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 critical traditions and revolutionary struggles. So um, I think we have a lot of reflection to do, and uh, and at the at the at the end of it, I think that African students or, or black students are going to be the biggest um, uh, what's the word like they're going to be the biggest uh, victims of this kind of uh, 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 what's the word insincere insincere careerist and insincere uh, approach that we've seen uh, emerging in the universities over the past. Uh, 20 or so years, this, this, this tradition, I mean, sorry, this approach that presents itself as critical, but is actually masking its need to be promoted within the academy. Black students are the ones who suffer because of how much de-skilling, and I know this, I know this, Pedro will know because I was his teacher, that uh, black students increasingly don't believe that they need to uh, master any mathematics, they don't need to master any science, they don't have to make that effort because if they can just give a political opinion or they can give uh, a sociological uh, a generic sociological opinion, somehow all the problems can be understood from that lens. And so I think we're in a very precarious position and we, 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 we instead of asking how the humanities need to be defended, uh, which is one set of debates, we need to ask ourselves what we've also got to do in terms of um, actually saving ourselves from ourselves. Um, Prof. Mkiza, thank you so much. Uh, I, 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 I see that that is how your, your plane was landing there. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> colleagues, uh, two wonderful uh, inputs from uh, our, 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 our two speakers. Uh, and I won't even um, summarize or do anything to those inputs. Rather, I will throw it up to, to the floor uh, for a question and answer session. Please note that uh, uh, you are allowed to type your comments on the, on the chat box, or alternatively, you can go right there at the bottom to raise your hand, and then um, I will note you uh, to to ask your question or, um, or, or make your, your comment. Um, the floor is yours, colleagues. All right, um, I'm just trying to read your name properly. Uh, Jean Paul Solomons, um, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just, basically, I just had one comment to make and that's actually to Prof Mkise. Um, I wanna thank you for, for what you've presented here because um, I'm a lecturer at Northwest. I'm a graduate of um, uh, UCT, did my PhD there. And th there's some issues that you've raised here that I do not hear um, being discussed in social science spaces. The overly politicized nature of knowledge and political rhetoric at the expense of rigorous intellectual engagement is something that has left me at times disillusioned about the social sciences. So I want to thank you for, for what you've presented here. I want to thank you for um, being willing to be a, a provocateur, a catalyst for, for intellectual engagement. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. I just wanted to thank you for what you've said. Lovely, thanks, thanks JP. 
Uh, just a, a question from me, um, if you allow, uh, to both Prof Desai and uh, Prof Nomalanga. Um, what I would like to know is, um, the university as an institution, uh, it operates within the, 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 the parameters or the landscape of uh, this capitalist global framework uh, we live under. So, and, and, and sociology now finds itself uh, as, a, as, a, as a discipline existing within uh, this genre of, 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 of the university as an organization. Now, my question is, is, is it possible to have a sociology um, that could exist outside this uh, capitalist framework that the organization called the university exists under, where it is able to live, um, you know, outside the, the, the KPAs or the accumulative objectives of uh, the university structure as it abides to the capitalist framework? Is it possible to have another framework, another existence of the discipline where uh, relations and, uh, you know, human sensibilities, problem solving can be a priority outside the framework of accumulation? Okay, uh, let me take one more, then uh, our speakers can, can come in for this round. Um, Trevor? Uh, thank you very much for really uh, eye-opening and challenging inputs from our speakers. So um, <clears throat> I was intrigued when uh, Professor Nomala Ngamkiza said, sociology was something you learn in struggle. <laughs> so I was thinking, you know, uh, I learned a lot of sociology in struggle. <clears throat> Perhaps now I'm just joining the department for my retirement. So I want them to uh, maybe just explore a bit the concept of scholar activism, you know, uh, in a situation where maybe, you know, movements, including the labor movement, are not that strong. So, you know, um, activists or, the, or, or those who want to intervene directly in social affairs uh, on the side of the oppressed, you know, how, you know, how, how do they think about this concept? Uh, yes, thank you. All right, thanks, Trevor. Um, let me allow the, the, the speakers to address these uh, three or four questions and comments, and then I will come for, for, for the second round. Uh, Prof Nkiza, Prof Desai, over to you. Um, uh, I don't mind going first. Um, uh, Pedro, to your, to your question, uh, you know, my, my, my answer would be, of course we can. Of course there are spaces uh, in which you can exploit to do the kinds of research, to do the teaching, to do the activism uh, that, that, that you find important that is anti the system. Uh, and, and so for me, there, there are spaces uh, where you work, where you live, that you can fight around. And uh, how one uses that, uh, you know, different people have different ways. Uh, the way I'm, I'm trying to use that space that has been afforded me is precisely the kind of work that um, uh, I'm doing about uh, black rugby in the Eastern Cape, which completely blew my mind. I spent so long uh, in the Eastern Cape, but never understood that from the 1880s, what the game meant, um, uh, the, the rich histories. In 1935, there was a Colisi that dropped a goal for the Eastern province against Transvaal. The uh, Sia Colisi wasn't the first. And to collect those 300 photographs, you know, from the 1880s, uh, for me, changed the way I even thought about many of the things uh, before I started the research including how people thought and fought around the issue of race and non-racialism. So in Makanda, in Gramstown, where I spent so long, I never understood how these complexions were working themselves out. Uh, the Mfengu, the so-called colored, 
African and so on, and what that unity in the 70s meant under Sakos. What did non-racialism mean to those people? I'm interviewing them when they're 70 years, 75 years old now, and they still carry this thing with them. It's, 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 it's not like reduced to a theory, but it's a way of living. Uh, you know, it's those borders in Makanda were crossed. So I think the, the university still offers us that space. And, and you're right, uh, you know, we've we got to get uh, beyond the rhetoric. Let's decolonize the curriculum. But, but in decolonizing the curriculum, what are the new archives that we are creating? Uh, are we really even going and, 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 and doing these things? So that even in rugby, you know, people just stop by saying, oh, rugby was grabbed by the new African elite in the civilizing mission. Well, to a certain extent it was, but to a certain extent it wasn't. It was grabbed by the working classes who went to work on the mines and so on, and they grabbed those opportunities to play the game. So even when we think that we're decolonizing uh, the curriculum, we're not going deep and, and, and some things become almost like uh, the knowledge of the time, but they're not, when you go and dig more seriously, you find that it's actually not true. And so, so I think there are spaces then people have other ways in which they might want to exploit those, those spaces. That doesn't mean we don't stop and think and take cognizance of a particular conjuncture. Uh, in terms of struggle, uh, Trevor, I, I, I think um, that these are the complexities. Sometimes when, when uh, academics tell me they want to get involved in community struggles, I thought, oh God, please don't. You'll mess the whole thing up. Uh, uh, or, or sometimes you, you, you're more a hindrance. But, but there are complexities that one should grapple with. And I'll just give you one example of that, that you know better than me in many of these instances, that you know, I was in a meeting in the South Basin of Durban last night, and Engine signaled, it might be a lie, that they are leaving. And, and we had to contend with different kinds of issues there because uh, the government and Engine put out that there'll be 650 jobs lost, but maybe 9,000 jobs. So there was one paranoia about NGEN and the job loss. There's another a wonderful opportunity to rethink the South Basin, think from reparations to renewable energies in that incredible part of, of the South Basin. And so you have to contend with different arguments. Uh, and somebody just come in saying, oh, we'll just have a just transition. is meaningless to people's everyday lives because NGEN is something that some of those jobs were handed down through the generations. So getting involved in communities is also uh, difficult because, you know, a lot of people want to arrive in the, in the community as if they're the Leninist vanguard. Somehow they have a higher consciousness through reading books and they will, you know, give it as a gift to, to the masses. Well, it doesn't work like that. And I think we have to be careful of that. Um, well, uh, I think, uh, you know, Ashwin's uh, point about, you know, the, 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 that where is the creation of the new archive is probably the most important um, question for, for, the, for South Africa. Look, um, I, this is why I say I'm, I'm, I'm not really a sociologist, it's just that one cannot be, uh, uh, you know, bound in boxes. I'm trained as a historian. So, you know, trying to get through UCT sociology. Uh, 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 hey, David Cooper, hi. <laughs> okay, yes, you were still the head of the department then. Shame, you, they, they squeezed that dissertation through. I spent my time in the Cape archives, right? Because that's how, that's the South African tradition of sociology. We, 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 we sit in archives. That's what we do. Um, so, whether you're a historian or whether you are a sociologist, you can't study black people unless you find them. Um, you can't study our history unless you go and reconstruct it. So you can't be a sociologist who just sort of theorizes off the top of nothing. You gotta go sit with archives, you know? And so I guess that's why they gave me a PhD there at UCT in the end. Um, shame, they really were, they, they were very accommodating. Um, so that question is probably the, question that should be asked, you know, this sort of like vacuous nonsense of like yeah, decoloniality, ooh, we're going to, you know, whatever that stuff is. It's like, so what? So what? We know we're oppressed. <laughs> so then what? You know, at the level of epistemic knowledge, at least uh, at the level of knowledges, the question is therefore what? You know, you can't act as if you're disempowered at the level at which you're creating knowledge because, um, you know, it's, it's a, 
it's it, you can actually write things. I mean, people say, oh, we write ourselves into existence. Yes, you write yourself into existence, but you didn't drop out of the sky. You came from a lineage and lineages of 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 of, of academic. Um, sorry, not academic, of, of, of knowledge making, you know, uh, in various forms. And so one of the ways in which knowledge was made in this country was in struggle, um, because it could not be made, obviously, in the, in the institutionalized uh, form. So it, the, 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 the writing of, 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 you know, let's just say the writing of the oppressed, of Black people, of Africans, and, and all the people that uh, have, have been in resistance to the kind of system we've had here in South Africa, has been, it has existed largely in, in, in struggle. Um, so Trevor, yes, you, you, you are a professor in the, from the School of Struggle. Now they just formalize you with the certificate, but in reality, that's because you need to access the resource base that is the post-apartheid university. And it's very important for you to access that resource base for two reasons. One, so that you're not constantly dying of poverty as, a, as, a, as an activist. I mean, there's no justification for you to plead poverty. Um, and secondly, so that our students can, can understand that uh, uh, our traditions of learning don't just come from the, 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 the professor. They come from the professor and from those who are professors of struggle and it can be one and the same person. Um, but of course, as Ashwin says, in South Africa, what we've done is we've created KPAs of community engagement. Um, and, uh, and also we have, um, we have uh, uh, what I call struggle envy. You know, we have, we have a, a tradition that somehow a perverse tradition in this country where people want to be associated with struggles just because it's cool. You know, this boutique kind of, uh, activism where you sort of curate yourself into black people or the, the struggles of those who, 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 who you know and it's it's actually a global problem that thing it's something that comes from uh, uh especially you know um the middle classes of the global north you know the need to it's a missionary opposition the need to be seen to be doing the good thing and then what you do is you walk into people's communities and you you actually mess things up and we see that with ngos all the time um so so i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't be so 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 accepting of anyone saying i'm a scholar activist we okay we know the debates about abash talibazam john dolo right we know those debates so this need to position oneself as an academic activist because it makes one appear to be in line with some radical trendy cutting edge thing to me is absolute nonsense um, but, you know, when you emerge in from that space and you just happen to land up in the university because you need the resource base, you're entitled to it, Trevor, right? I mean, you're entitled to public institutions so that our, our students can, can get the, the benefit of that knowledge that didn't come from people that went and did field work, you know, and, and so on. Um, so, it, but it's a, it's, I know it's a messy thing in South Africa. I mean, I could go on and on about it. Everybody who knows me knows that I, 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 it, 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 it frustrates me that we don't, we, we went to a phase in this country where in, this, in, a, in the academy, in the humanities, where there was insufficient um, reflection on what it means for people to call themselves scholar activists. Just because you teach Marxism, just because you can access a black community, just because you're, you know, you're queer, and you therefore, you know what I'm saying? Just because you happen doesn't mean. So the issue is, um, so what does it mean? At the end of everything is the need for uh, intellectual honesty and for intellectual integrity. There's no point in no longer lying. I'm middle class, you know? Yes, I come from a rural area, but I'm very middle class. I have my own struggles, but you know, um, the issue is you, you, you have got to, to, to function in, with a sense of integrity about yourself and not to position yourself because the university rewards that. Which then brings me to this point, Pedro, this is a very important point you're asking about the neoliberal university, which is a very dangerous animal because it adapts very quickly to anything that is consumer ready. So if decolonization is what the masses are asking for, the, neo, the neoliberal university can adapt extremely fast to absorb that discourse and begin to churn out outputs and churn out um, the appearance of doing that decolonization. That is why, and so even the scholar activist fakeness that we've seen is a part of that. So that is why uh, Solomon, 
So I have John Paul, I think, uh, uh, sorry, I've, I, I didn't catch the full name. That's why it's easy for people to appear to be speaking meaningfully, meaningful politics in universities, but actually they're advancing their internal uh, middle-class career because the university is now capable of adapting very fast to whatever the demand is. It will, it, the, the something about the animal that we have, it will shift and absorb that and permit that to become the latest thing that uh, people need for promotion for for acceptance um, so so you can see that uh, with with how as soon as the students were, were effectively uh, crushed and pushed out of the universities uh, with fees must fall the biggest proponents of decolonization became white women so <laughs> You know, one day you woke up and every goddamn white female academic is telling us about how they're decolonizing in their classrooms. Publishing like this. So, and, and being rewarded and applauded. And, 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 and so the university isn't actually averse to using the discourse. It does exactly that. It absorbs it and then converts it into an output form so that it can tick off the boxes, because if that's what the brand needs, if that's what's recognized, then that's what it will do. And so that's why, in fact, the, the difficult work of the archive, of, and when I say the archive, because again, now I'm hearing all this mishmash of people just saying, ooh, the black archive, the black archive, having never even seen a, a single archive or even spoken properly to their grandmothers. The hard work of reconstructing the lives of those who have not been given voice in our history in South Africa is not glamorous. It is not something, you know, for, for Ashwin or myself or whoever to have to travel, to go and sit in a whole town so you can try and find a policy somewhere from 18's Banban. That is work. So this whole, uh, uh, so I'm hearing this infiltration of this like, you know, you know, we're just gonna like find, you know, we're gonna like write. No, it isn't like that. Shut up, go sit in an archive, go open some boxes and then come tell us what you found there. We wanna hear about that goalies. We don't wanna hear you theorize it the whole time. And so the, 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 the work of, that is necessary is, 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 is not being done, but the words are being spoken. And part of that, again, because the neoliberal university is good as a type of social, sociological institution, it's good at actually adapting. It means that you can speak the decolonization so long as you publish on it, so long as you, you position it in a way that doesn't threaten anyone, um, and you don't have to do the actual work. Whereas traditionally what is supposed to happen is I'm supposed to sit with Ashwin, with Pedro, with the people at Sasa and say, okay, I went to the archives, here's what I have presented. People go in on what I've got and they go, okay, this evidence, that, that doesn't look so great, that the, those archives are, are not great. They're, they're sitting in London, the real ones. No, in fact, you have to go talk to those people. So it's, we are living, uh, I see you, Pedro, yeah, we are living in a very, very tricky time and I think I think the question is, how do we get back the sense of, of intellectual integrity back into the South African university context? I, I, I think that's the discussion. All right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Mkiza. Thank you, Prof. Desai. Uh, I'm just going to go now maybe to the second and the last round of uh, comments and, and questions. I do see some on the chat box. Uh, but there was a hand I saw from uh, Enver, en Enver Mutala. Do you want to pose your question? Thank you, uh, Pedro. Is it possible to make a comment rather than a question? Yes, yes. You're allowed. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, thanks very much. I must say I was, these are two very, very insightful uh, presentations. Uh, and I actually like the... Uh, the chastising of uh, yeah of what goes on in academia has has been quite uh, has been uh, necessary timeless and uh, has to be said over and over again because I it's absolutely true that uh, 
what we do in university is becoming increasingly uh, on, the, on the one hand subservient to a, a global agenda uh, but on the other hand increasingly irrelevant to the struggles of uh, the great majority of humanity. Uh, it doesn't even begin to understand what the issues are because of the uh, uh, because of the pretense at uh, at the production of scholarly knowledge, which is really what perform performance uh, uh, pretends to be. My own uh, view of the university system has always been that it's it's never been close to the real world, not from its earliest. Uh, and you have to understand it historically whether it's from its uh, medieval incarnation in, in medieval sco scholarship or, or the, uh, the proclaimed uh, rationalism of en Western en Enlightenment, uh, which uh, had absolutely no difficulty with slavery and colonialism uh, and uh, the subjugation of nations, or indeed it, throughout, through the process of the building of uh, higher education institutions under uh, colonial nationalist regimes. What's very, very worrisome for me today, uh, Pedro, in response to your question, is that we're, we're actually going, uh, we're extending the remit of global corporate capitalism in ways which are much, much more dangerous for humanity, given the rise of neo-fascist and sometimes openly fascist uh, nationalist movements, uh, in which, uh, which by the way, have captured several governments globally. Uh, the best case in point being the US actually, uh, but also Brazil, India as an extremely egregious case, uh, uh, the, a lot of Eastern Europe, et cetera, et cetera, and even so-called socialist states. So this emergence, re-emergence of uh, uh, fascism, uh, I don't think that universities are anywhere close to understanding the implications of uh, these developments. And it comes at a time particularly when social movements, those political and social organizations, workers' organizations in particular, uh, are weak as they were prior to World War II. It is a combination of uh, the imploding nationalist movements, poor, or weak organizations uh, in, the, in the most marginalized uh, communities of, of the globe and, and ex of course the extremely uh, authoritative uh, power of, of corporate uh, interests in universities has, is making the situation I think considerably more dangerous for humanity uh, than it ever has been. Thanks for that. All right. Uh... Thank you, thank you, Prof. Motala. Um, <clears throat> before you come back in, Prof. Giza and uh, Prof. Desai, I just want to go through uh, the comments here on the on the chat box. Um, I hope you can hear me, and I also hope that you can also see the comments there. The first one is from Uchena Okeja, and it reads as follows. Uh, now that we know that a lot of what was done in the name of decolonization is, un is unhelpful, what should we do with the legacy of the theorists of decolonization? Ignore the theorists, but the concept seems to be the major organizing framework uh, of thought in the social sciences and humanities today. That's from Uchena Okeja. I hope you've noted that. And then the next one is from Cleopatra Nobile Shezi. And it says, why are we busy keeping on talking about decolonization, but practically we are not acting? And then the last one I have here from Zaneta Janssen, 
it says, this is really depressing to hear, the truth hurts. It's depressing to hear that the sociology of the 80s and the 90s carried a seed of hope for real change for the poorest marginalized in the society. And here we are in 2020 under conditions allowing for a space for debate. And we in South African sociology are still decrying the same issues of a lack of, of same issues of lack, of want, of selling out. Where did we go wrong? We have never been a homogeneous group. How then do we go beyond those deep-seated divisions? This is a painful reality. Um, those are the comments from the, from, from the chat box and also noting what uh, uh, Enver has also made as a, as a, as a comment. Uh, if you could come back in, uh, Prof. Desai and Prof. Nkize, to uh, address those uh, comments and questions that have, uh, that have come through. Any one of you can, can, can go ahead first. Okay, I'm quite happy to, you know, I, 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 I'm, you know, and I, I don't say this easily, I'm actually incredibly positive. I mean, we, these things are a part of, you know, uh, different generations fight different issues. You know, I, I was reading a series of articles in, journal, in a South African journal written about, you know, 50 years of E.P. Thompson. And not one of those academics, great as they are, actually got what E.P. Thompson meant to us who were activists in the 80s. E.P. Thompson, for us, wasn't about only E.P. Thompson. E.P. Thompson was a hammer to knock the Althusserians who we saw as Stalinists. So... These are, these are battles you fight uh, at particular junctions and they're important battles because, I mean, just think, and, you know, to fast forward till next year, they're already setting themselves up, uh, the South African Communist Party, because it's 100 years of communism in South Africa. And, and, and those of us who felt the pinch of Stalinism are also gearing up to say how the stench of Stalinism is still with us in the present. These are not only academic battles or intellectual battles, these are real practical battles uh, given the fact why we need to take it seriously is because you didn't need sociology. It was banned in the Soviet Union because their form of Marxism was the truth. So what could sociology say anyways uh, to them, uh, notwithstanding that, you know, uh, toward the top uh, Communist Party members in South Africa, Yunus Karim and uh, Bladin Zaman, they're sociologists, but those are the contradictions uh, of, of, of Marxism. So, I mean, I, I think these are these are battles that are fought in new forms. And, and so even the issue about decolonization, recolonization, how we subtract and add to the archives, how we do research, we're there in the 80s between the social historians and the so-called Marxists when they saw the social historians saying, these guys only carry tape recorders, they don't understand the state, they don't understand capital accumulation, they don't have to understand their working class and so on. These are very important in new forms and in new circumstances and the important fights. Uh, so I'll give you an example. If you pick up the Thinker magazine, uh, the latest one, there's an article there written by uh, one professor Broadbent, and he's talking about the 14th Industrial Revolution, and he explains why the 14th Industrial Revolution comes to England first, because he thinks it's something to do with the temperament of the English. In one article, he writes out um, colonialism, he writes out imperialism, he writes out slavery, he writes out indenture. So the, 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 the right-wing knowledge is always there. It comes, it comes back until, uh, so the debunking part of our work is important. And nobody's saying that the, the whole uh, sort of drive to decolonization uh, of the curriculum is not important. But if it becomes an end of itself and people want to go back and do the kinds of hard graft that Prof. Nkiza were talking about, then it becomes a dead end. And sometimes what you find in the archives hurts you. Sometimes what you find in the archives completely capsizes you. And I'll leave you with just this one example. Uh, you know, I went to the historian to look at the history of Gandhi. And, you know, it's irrefutable. It's written in his words. He was a racist. You know, people say, oh, he changed over time. Like Mandela didn't want to join Indians in the struggle and then he changed. Mandela didn't have an idea in his head about racism that somehow 
Africans were superior to Indians or Indians were superior to Africans. Again, you had a well thought out theory that Aryans were closer to whites and Africans were lower down the scale. So sometimes the archives do add to knowledge, but not in ways that build nationhood or build social cohesion. Sometimes it ruptures things and it opens up things. And that is why the debunking work is still important and is going on. But you can't just say Gandhi's a racist. You must go out there and show word for word. And what are the implications of Gandhi's racism into the present about how people think about themselves? What is ethnicity and race and the implications of the kind of uh, multinationalism of the ANC into the present around identity. So I, I'm, I'm uh, Zanetta, I'm, I'm positive. I'm, I'm excited that at the age of 61, uh, in the year that, you know, 1959, that C. R. Mills wrote The Sociological Imagination, that we're imagining things anew. So there's some power there. And so no depression. And we don't have to be a homogenous group, but still, there's something that is driving us right now and that we have some power uh, in the universities, a new cohorts of students coming through, thinking things anew. That's quite beautiful. Um, I was just struck by the, your, your, your phrase, uh, Ashwin, recolonized by, de basically we've been recolonized by the decolonization discourse, <laughs> you know, um, but it's true that I think the Debates are, it's a cyclical thing, you know, where one can't uh, take this European teleological view of time and, you know, things somehow they, they, they sort of work themselves out. They work themselves out in spirals, you know, they work themselves out, then you come back again. And the reason for that is very simple. It's a life issue. Young people are born, they have to acquire new knowledges that they didn't know, and old people die and have to relinquish old ideas that they, they had. So it's, it's one of those life cycle things. Um, I think uh, in terms of Professor Okeja's question, uh, so what to do with the, with the sort of, some of the mistakes. So there were two things with the, the way the decolonization issue went in, in South Africa. Uh, the students, I think, uh, won a very uh, strong uh, victory in actually, it's unfortunate that it had to come at such a cost, but the fact that students had to go to the extent of even burning buildings just to demonstrate that there was need to be heard shows you just how much resistance already was in the system. You know, how long have we been talking about transformation? How long have we been saying that there needs to be change? So that students had to put, you know, as they say, they had to put their bodies on the line for a simple matter of, please, can we just, you know, have a, a normal African curriculum, tells you that there's something deeply wrong in South African uh, education. There's something extremely wrong in South African education. Uh, and I'm talking here about higher education. So what Enver's point, Enver's point is correct, that actually the university has always been, uh, 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 always been out of touch. You know, it's designed that way, but it's in, South, in, in Africa, the, the university has always been a, a, an institution also that has, a, has another social function other than simply to just sort of be a part. It's also there to create knowledge to actually further the oppression of, of the indigenous. So that students had to go all out just to make a simple point like can we just have a normal curriculum that's not the student's problem that's the problem of the academy but because the academy was that stubborn the students fought a battle where they missed something and it's not their fault that they missed this thing what they missed was that the south african university is not just a colonial animal it's a corporatized animal and those two are not the same thing they are outcomes of the same uh, sort of 400 year process. But when we talk about the corporatization, we're not talking about this, uh, a colonial university. Fort Hare was a colonial university, but it was not a corporatized university. So the corporatization is its own thing in and of itself. And students didn't understand at the time. Hence, they can go and say, we want a black vice chancellor. And then not knowing already that we have black vice chancellors who are destroying institutions right now. We want a black female vice chancellor. And then when the black female vice chancellor arrives, she's like Thatcher on steroids. And, un, and, and you're unable to deal with the new black managerial class in these universities. There's nothing new. Go ask the rest of the African continent. They've been through this. They've been through the neoliberal university. It destroyed all their universities. And it was black managers that destroyed them. It was the black management class that destroyed, that put the final nail in the coffin of the African university. It wasn't white racists. 
And the same thing is happening in South Africa here today. So as, as Ashwin is saying, when, you need, what, when you're honest about what you do, you accept that you, you are going to find things that are going to contradict your worldview. That is the beginning of intellectual ethics, that you're not going to try to make everything cohere to your worldview when you find a contradiction. And one of the contradictions that students could, I think they, they in some sense, you know, the Witzweischers, ex Habib, kind of, in some sense, maybe it's like, no, we do criticize black management. Ah, uh -uh. I don't think they fully understand the post-colonial problem in South African universities. If you don't understand what the historically black universities are going through, if you don't understand what the historically black technicons that have been converted into universities of technologies are going through, if you don't understand what the TVETs are going through, if you don't understand that whole, the majority of the South African sector, but because you're at VIRT or at UCT and, hey, Habib, down with you, you know, and hey, Max Price, that's, not even the issue. That's not even the issue. And the students couldn't have perceived it because they're young. But those of us who are long in the system and we know what the machinations are around the corporate power and the way it actually doesn't care whether you use the word decolonize or whether you're going to use intersectional, it's still going to turn around and turn you into an output. It's still going to turn, convert intellectual thought into production. And I think many of our students who are bright and are coming into the universities are going to learn that once they're in the university that, shit, it turns out decolonization wasn't the problem. <laughs> it turns out it's, a, it's, it's, it's something else. And conveying that to students was very difficult because they didn't want to be um, engaged in a way that it says, when you go into your archive, you will find things that contradict your initial assumption. So I would say that that's the main thing is that the essence of, 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 of integrity, of knowledge, is that you are open to the idea that there's something you may not know that may upturn everything, even if you are talking from a morally righteous position. You can believe you are morally righteous in your sociology and your theory. But then when you find something that contradicts that, especially in reality, then you need to deal with the contradiction. And I think a lot of what I've seen now, a lot of what I see, especially with the new wave of like weird, uh, U.S. feminism that I constantly criticize is that it does not want to see contradiction. Everything can only be a gender lens in this one way. And if it's not this way, it reminds me of Christianity. So do we see any hope? Yes, because I'm here, right? And I don't mean that in a trite way. So it means that there is a resistant awareness amongst us. And so we have to, but I know that our, 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 our universities are very oppressive. So yeah, I'm aware that it's, it's a difficult time. I'm not as, as, as uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Let's have another discussion when uh, Trevor, no, no, Pedro, if we still need the institutions like this. I think that I need a whole nother thing for that one. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Mkise and also, uh, uh, Prof. Desai, um, we are ahead of time, uh, which is good. Uh, just nine minutes before uh, half past three. Um, I don't know if there is uh, appetite for another round or should we head for closure rather, President? Um, let me see on the, on the chat box. And I also don't see hands. All right. It looks like we. It looks like we're good. All right, um, colleagues. Let's uh, proceed ahead towards the closure of the, of the of the of the of the program. I'm now going to invite uh, our colleague in the in the in the council of the association uh, to give a, a vote of thanks and also close it uh, for us simultaneously. Uh, Dr. Jean Paul Solomon from the Northwest University. Uh, the floor is yours, my brother. All right. Um, thank you, Pedro, and uh, thank you, colleagues. So, firstly, um, I just want to thank both uh, Prof. Desai and Prof. Mkise um, for your catalytic and engaged. Um, 
presentations today. I, I won't try to do the, you the injustice of trying to summarize what has been said, but I think what, what I do want to mention is that what you've given us today is not a cliched or simplistic discussion of sociology in South Africa, but I think you've provided us with a, an intellectual catalyst. And I hope that these discussions that have started in this space uh, will continue going forward. Um, on that point, I want to mention that um, while this is the first SASA webinar, this seminar slash webinar series will continue. And I hope that you will join us in future events. That being said, um, I've, I've just posted something in, in the chat room, in the chat part of this interaction. Um, sociology.africa, that's the SASA website address. Um, also, if you'd like to connect with us on Twitter, our Twitter handle is SASA underscore sociology. So that's S-A-S-A -S -A underscore sociology. And, and I hope that perhaps this conversation that has started here could continue on that platform as well. Last but certainly not least, um, I want to thank Pedro um, and the other council members who have played the essential role, roles in organizing today's event. Um, but also those who have participated, I realize some had to pop in and out because we, we all have other commitments. But to those of you who are still here, thank you very much um, for your participation and your presence today. Um, so yeah, just to, to, to echo what Dr. Nguane has said in his opening remarks, we hope that this event is the start of exciting engagements in the future. And we hope that um, you will continue to engage with SASA going forward. So yeah, that's, that's all I have to say. Thanks again to Pedro, Prof Desai, Prof Nkize. And um, just to reiterate, Pedro has just responded to a question in the chat. We will share the recording of this event um, on our website. And we will post the link to that um, using our Twitter handle as well. So please join us on those platforms. Thank you everybody for being here and we hope to see you next time. So long. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody.